I do not feel like I just got off a plane and traveled halfway around the world. Uh, I feel like a normal day. I don't know. That must be the grace or I think it's the great Australian coffee. I think that's the key that has helped me out here. So I'm so thrilled to be with you all. And uh, as Charbel mentioned, I'm going to be talking a lot about Our Lady here, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, who here loves Mary? Well, we got a lot of people who love Mary. I have a question for you, though. How many of you know the human Mary? Like what Mary was going through moment by moment in her life. How many of you know that story, what St. John Paul II called the, the spiritual interior pilgrimage of faith that Mary made? Do you know that story? Because that's what I'm going to be walking through with you all today. I want us to get us to know Mary at a deeper level through the eyes of God's Word and sacred scripture. And we're going to see there's just so much packed in the scriptures about Our Lady. She doesn't appear often. Uh, in the Bible, and that's true, and there's not many lines that she has where she's speaking, but when she does present, when she does come into play, we're going to see it's in passages that are just packed with so much significance, uh, and I want to really unpack that significance for you as we walk through the story of her life. So there are a couple things I'm going to be drawing from this evening. I'm going to be drawing from, uh, first of all, this book that I wrote called Walking with Mary, A Biblical Journey from Nazareth to the Cross. This is going to be the main outline of what we're going to cover this evening. But secondly, I'm going to be drawing on another book that I wrote that just came out about a little less than a year ago. So in the last 12 months this came out. It's called Praying the Rosary Like Never Before. Uh, many of us may have heard about the rosary. Some of us are avid devotees. We pray the rosary regularly, but we know we could pray it better. We struggle sometimes. We don't put our heart into it. Our mind wanders. And how do I, how do, can I pray this prayer better? But then there may be others of us here who say, I know that's an important prayer, but I, 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 it's too long. I don't have that much time. I, I, I don't want to, I don't, it's too boring. It's too monotonous. How can we open up the rosary for beginners as well as those who've been praying it for many, many years? I want to touch on that tonight. And really the one thing that does tie it all together is uh, this video series. Can I just get a show of hands? Is anyone familiar with this video, this documentary series I did on the Blessed Virgin Mary? We filmed this in the Holy Land. And we were right there in Israel. We got to go to all the places and the sites where Mary lived and where all these events in her life took place. So I'll say a few more words about this one a little bit later. But anyway, just give you a background of what we're going to be looking at. But I think as we're about to start, what we really need to do is turn to Mary and ask her to pray for us. So would you be willing to say a Hail Mary with me? Yes. We begin? Let's do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to tell you a story about something that happened in my family that I think has happened many times in your families. And some of you may be old enough to have witnessed this happen in your family. Have you ever seen a baby take their first steps? Have you ever witnessed that? Isn't that an exciting moment? I want to tell you a story about my daughter, Josephine. Now, Josephine's older now, and she's got a bubbly, curly-haired little girl. But, but way back when she was just about one or so, she was learning how to walk. And she was, you could tell she was practicing and thinking about it at home. Do you ever see a baby where they'll crawl over to a table and then they'll climb, you know, they'll put their hands on the table and they're, they're standing up on their own and that's exciting or they'll crawl to a little chair and they'll stand up. Well, we were on a retreat with a bunch of our students and we're up in the mountains in, in Colorado where I live in the United States and Josephine, there was a chair in the middle of the room and all the students were all sitting in a big circle and Josephine crawled to the chair and she stood stood up holding herself on the chair and she was all excited and standing up and everyone's all clapping for her standing up there. And, and then I came over to the side and I said, oh, Josephine, come, take your first steps. Come on, baby, you could do it. And she let go with one hand and smile and she'd go, ah, and then she'd go, ah, I don't know if I want to do that. And she'd hold on with both hands again. Then she'd look over, oh, maybe I should think about, oh, I don't know if I want to let go of the chair. And she'd hold on again. But then there was one time where she let go with one hand, and then she let go with a second hand. 
And for the first time, little Josephine was standing on her own two feet without holding anything. And everyone's cheering her on, Josephine, Josephine. I said, come on, baby, you can do it. Take the first step. She could tell her she wants to do it. And then all of a sudden, her legs started going like this. <laughs> they started getting a little wobbly. And that look of excitement on her face quickly turned to a look of horror. She was worried she was going to lose her balance and fall. So she quickly clung on to the security of the chair and looked over me as if to say, Dad, what are you trying to make me do? <laughs> but little Josephine eventually got her footing again. She got herself to stand up, and, uh, and then she let go with one hand, and then she let go with the second hand. But this time, when her legs got shaky, instead of going backwards toward the security of the chair, little Josephine fell forward, one, two, three, into my arms, and she took her first three steps. And everyone was cheering, yeah! And then she crawled right back to that chair, stood up and said, again? <laughs> and she falls forward, one, two, three, four. And then she crawls back and she says, again? One, two, three, four, five. And we played that game for about a half hour that afternoon. And we played that game for several weeks when we got back home. And after about a month, walking became Josephine's primary mode of transportation. <laughs> but it's, it's hard and it's scary to take a step in an area you've never gone before. To take that first step is hard, not just for little babies, but for even us adult children of God, where God often asks us to take that next step of faith with him. He does this with all the great heroes in the Bible, like Abraham. Come and leave your land and go leave your family and all this familiar with you and come to this distant place, the land of Cana. And you can imagine Abraham going, um, I don't know that place. There's a lot of strange people over there. Uh, I'm going to, have to leave all my friends. I don't know if I want to do that. I want to stay here at the security of the chair. Or Moses called by God to lead the people out of Egypt. You know, I don't want to go back to that place. They were trying to kill me before. Are you kidding me? Do you want to choose someone else? I just, I'm comfortable where I am now. Or people like St. Peter, who's having a fine life as a fisherman. He's doing all fine. Then Jesus says, leave those nets behind and I'll make you a fisher of man. I don't know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. It's not just biblical characters, it's modern day saints. Uh, whether it's someone like St. Mother Teresa who was working as a Loretto sister in India, very happy, not looking for a new job, loving her job as a teacher, serving middle class people in India, and then one day God calls her to leave everything that was dear to her, her friends and the Loretto sisters, her love for the students that she was teaching to leave all that behind and go out onto the streets of Calcutta and serve the poorest of the poor. And she's struggling. I, I, I want to follow your will, God, but why don't you choose someone else? I really like what I'm doing here. He does this with all great saints, all great disciples. He even did it with someone known as the Blessed Virgin Mary. Do you know the story of Mary's faith? Do you know the various steps of faith that she took throughout her life? Those moments when God calls her and invites her to say yes and then say yes again. It wasn't just a one-time yes in her fiat in Nazareth at the Annunciation. Over and over again, God, like a father leading their child, says, okay, now take another step. Oh, good, now take another step. And we see this all throughout Mary's life. Do you know this part of Mary? Do you know the Bible's revelation about who she was and what she was going through? Do you know those steps of faith in her interior pilgrimage of faith, as JP2 called it? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Because we're going to see that while many of us as Catholics were familiar with the Mary of doctrine and piety, which is beautiful and we need to know all that, you know, but, but sometimes Mary can seem like on a pedestal, far removed from my own life. We admire her. She's beautiful. It's wonderful. I mean, she was immaculately conceived. She never sinned her entire life, and I sin seven times a day at least. You know, I, I can't relate to that, but that, that's cool that she did that. And, you know, her body went up to heaven, right, when she died. Mine's going to go into a grave and beaten by worms, you know, so I can't really relate to that. She, you know, was, was totally pure. She was the virgin all throughout her life, and I may be struggling with purity. This is hard. You know, so, so I look at Mary's life, and I go, you know, I, 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 I admire her. I love her. I'll sing praises and songs about her. But what does her life really have to do with mine? 
And, and what we have to see is that while Mary was given unique, extraordinary graces and privileges, she was still a human. She was like us. And there are many things that she's going through that we can relate to, and God wants us to relate to her because she was human but followed God step by step in the midst of her challenges and difficulties and shows us the way forward. You know, Mary was human. She experienced the human joys of friendship, like with her kinswoman, Elizabeth. She experienced the joys of being a mom. She experienced the blessings of walking in God's ways, but she's human. She also experienced moments of difficulty, moments of trial, moments of darkness, moments when she doesn't understand what's happening. All she can do is just keep and ponder what's happening in, in, in her heart. There were moments where she, she had to walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible tells us explicitly there were times when Mary did not understand. She understood more than anyone else, and she still had to take that leap of faith. Do you know the key pivotal moments in Mary's life, the key steps of faith, when God invites her to take that next step? That's what we're going to be looking at. We're going to learn profound lessons for Mary as a model for our own walk with God. So that's one of the big themes I want us to consider. But before I get into the walk through Mary's life, I want to talk about a certain prayer, a beautiful prayer in our Catholic tradition, one that I think we're all familiar with, but one that really helps to write the story of Mary and Jesus on our hearts. And that's this prayer here, the rosary. This is an awesome prayer. This is a beautiful prayer. This is a powerful prayer. But I got to be honest with you, I meet many good Catholics who tell me it's not always an easy prayer. That this is a prayer that we sometimes can struggle with. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a very easy prayer on a certain level, right? Because the rosary is the very basic, you know, has puts together our fathers, Hail Marys, and Glory Bees. I mean, that, that's pretty basic, isn't it? I mean, that's like the ABCs of Catholic devotion right there. So it should be really easy, right? Uh, and it's awesome. It's powerful. We hear from, you know, the great tradition about this is this will save your family. It'll bring peace to the world. It'll change the world. But many people's experience of the rosary is not always that glorious. It's more like the sorrowful mysteries for many people's experience of the rosary, if they're honest. And I've given this, what I'm going to share with you, I've given this presentation to Protestants, to new Catholics, to devout Catholics, to religious contemplative sisters, to even bishops. And they all admit, we love the rosary, we know it's a good prayer, but it's hard. How is it hard? Let's talk about it. Can I, I mean, now this might not be the case, because you're all diehards here. I mean, you're, you're taking time on a Thursday night to come out and hear a talk about Mary. So you guys are like, you know, the top 99 percentile. You're, you're just so committed. This might not relate to you, but I'm just going to ask anyway. Can I ask a question? When you pray the rosary, do any of you, does your mind ever wander? Does that ever happen? Do you ever get distracted when you pray? Does that happen to people in Australia? You ever just, you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to pray this rosary, and I'm in the midst of the, you know, the first couple beads of that first joyful mystery. And about three beads into it, I, I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for dinner tonight or some problem at work, or something somebody said to me earlier today. What, what did she mean by that? Oh, wait, I'm supposed to be thinking about Gabriel, the angel coming to Mary, and, and my mind's wandering all over the place. I kind of feel bad about that, but does that ever happen to you? That's many people's real-life experience with the rosary. Or many other people do it this way. They'll, they'll, they'll treat the rosary kind of like a, a chore, a spiritual chore. You know, they check it off. Okay, I got my rosary in today but they don't put their heart into it. You know what I'm talking about? You, you feel like you're just kind of going through the motions, but you just check it off the list, but you don't, you're not sure if you're really getting that much out of it, and you kind of you feel bad about it, but you dread, oh, I got to get that rosary in. And, or you show up at that Catholic event, and then you see everybody pull out their beads, and you're thinking, oh, no, not a whole rosary. Maybe they'll just do a decade. And every decade really does feel like 10 years. And you're like, oh, it's only the second sorrowful mystery. When is this going to end? I mean, and you kind of feel bad about that because you know you're supposed to love this prayer. But, but I want to talk about this because many people don't talk about this. This is the real life experience 
of many people when they pray the rosary. Or do you ever do this one? You're busy, you're running around all day, you're really busy, and finally you get a chance to just sit down for a bit. Oh, good, I can go in the chapel or sit on my, my couch at home and I'll pull out those beads and what happens in the middle of that first decade? <laughs> you doze off in the middle of a Hail Mary. I want you all to be honest. How many of you could relate to any of these things I've just talked about, any of these struggles, right? We all struggle with this. Uh, again, I've had contemplative nuns. I've even had bishops with apostolic succession tell me, <laughs> Ted, I struggle all the time with the rosary. You know, I, I know it's supposed to be a great prayer, but I struggle. And, and, and if bishops are struggling, we can struggle too. But here's the good news. This is what I want to encourage you with, is this, that no matter what may happen when we be, we're praying this rosary, our mind may go wandering a million different directions, we may fall asleep, we feel uneasy and our heart's not in it. Here's the key thing. And I want to draw from the great doctor of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas. He, he reminds us that the foundation of all prayer is our intention. This is, a, this is true for the mass. This is true for when you take time to pray. It's certainly true for the rosary. It's what you do at the beginning. That's why it's so important that you don't just begin, or, uh, you make sign of the cross and just jump into prayer. It's what you do at just the very beginning. Jesus, I want to give you my full attention. I want to give you this rosary. I want to give you my best. If you come in with a good, sincere intention, even if you lose attention, there's still the foundation of a good intention that makes your prayer very fruitful. You see, the words you're praying, they're from the Bible. They're biblical. They're holy. You're giving God something. And if you come with a good intention, then you're giving something beautiful to God, even if it ends up a little messy. It reminds me of uh, my kids. Do you ever have this with your kids where they, you know, they turn about two, two and a half, they start drawing pictures, maybe three? So I've got some kids that they started drawing pictures recently, and it's just a bunch of scribbles. And they'll hand me this sheet of paper, and it's just a bunch of scribbles, and I'll look at it, and I'll go, what is that? And they say, that's you, Daddy. And I'm like, that doesn't look like that. That's just a bunch of scribbles. But what would you think if I took my little three-year-old's picture of me, the scribble, and I ripped the picture to shreds? And I yelled at my daughter. I said, don't you ever draw a picture for Daddy again until you get it exactly right. No good father would do that. As a dad, I, I love my daughter, and, I, and I, I see more than her scribbles. I see her heart, that she wants to give me a gift. She's thinking of me. And, and that, that it's the intention, her heart, that I see. That's what's most important. And the same is true in prayer. If we come in with a good intention, Jesus, I really am going to try to give you my best. Now, this is not an excuse to show up at Mass and say, well, you know, I'll just check my email and my phone and look at social media during the liturgy because Edward Sree says I just have to have a good intention. No, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about you're really going in, I'm going to give God my best. I'm going to try my best. Yeah, that's not really trying. But if you try your best in the rosary and, and, and your mind wanders, you fall asleep, God's still there. He sees your intention. But that being said, here's the issue. We want to all get better at praying the rosary, don't we? If my little daughter is 12 years old and she still can't draw a square or a circle, we have a problem. She needs to get better at drawing and you and I need to be, be better at praying our rosary. So what I want to do is share with you a couple insights from John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, on how he prayed the rosary and how this can really help us be more focused and encounter Jesus and Mary more profoundly in this beautiful prayer. So you ready? And the two, the two little insights I want to share with you are rooted in his reflections on the Hail Mary, which is the foundational prayer throughout the rosary. Uh, let, let's think about this. So it's rooted in, the, the, and, and it's really rooted in two big questions many people have about the rosary. What do you think people ask about the rosary? What are most, especially our non-Catholic Protestant brothers and sisters. What are their big concerns about the rosary? What do they say? Repetition. They say what? Repetition. Why do you have all this repetition? If you Catholics just read your Bible, you would know that Jesus condemns vain repetition. So why do Catholics repeat this prayer over and over again? We shouldn't be so mechanical. You should talk to Jesus as a friend. I mean, what husband comes home from work and pulls out little note cards and says, hi, honey, how are you? Hi, honey, how are you? Hi, honey, how are you? How are the kids? We don't talk that way to our loved ones. 
Don't talk like a robot to God. Treat him as your personal Lord and Savior and as a friend. I think those are fair, honest questions. And I think St. John Paul II has some awesome, great responses. We'll look at that in a moment. But what's the other big question people have about the rosary? Why are you worshiping Mary? Right? Why do you worship Mary? You're giving all this attention to Mary. Now, we as Catholics are pretty good, right? Because we say, we don't worship Mary. What do we do? We honor her or we venerate her. And that's a good move to make. Good apologetics 101. But I got to be honest with you. When I talk to my Protestant evangelical friends, I say, we don't worship Mary, we honor her. They'll grant me that worship honor distinction, but they're still uneasy about all the time and attention we give to Mary. Well, yeah, you might not, you say you don't worship her, but man, you spend a lot of time with her. I mean, think about this. What happens just in the rosary? Tell me about a decade of the rosary. What does a decade of the rosary consist of? One Our Father, followed by 10 Hail Marys, concluded by one Glory Be. So what's the score after every decade? One point for God the Father, one point for the Holy Trinity, and 10 points for the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's a little bit of an imbalance, you Catholics. Why are you spending so much time with Mary and not as much time with God? I mean, imagine a husband coming home from work on a weekend, and he spends one hour with his wife, one hour with his kids, and then 10 hours with some other woman. Is that going to go over well in a marriage? I don't think so. So why do you Catholics, when you pray the rosary, spend so much time with Mary, so disproportionate to the time you spend with God? Again, I think these are good, sincere questions. And St. John Paul II has some great answers. Are you ready? Let's talk about those answers. First of all, repetition. Let's talk about that. It's true. The Bible, in Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount, says, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Repetition. So don't have these empty phrases that you just keep repeating over and over, like the Gentiles. That's the key here. You see, the Gentiles, the pagans, had a practice of repeating certain phrases, names of God, and they would use it over and over again in order to try to get the God to come down and work for you. So I'm going to repeat this over and over again because I want to manipulate God to get God to come down and defend me in battle, make my business thrive, bring vengeance on my enemy. And so I'm treating God like Santa Claus. I'm treating God like someone, I, he's going to come down and work for me. So repeat, 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 repeat. And Jesus is saying, hey, don't treat your heavenly father like the pagans treat their gods. Your father knows what you need more than you do. He'll take care of you. Just trust him. Jesus isn't critiquing repetition itself. He's critiquing the pagan practice of trying to get God to come down and work for your will as opposed to surrendering your life and trusting his will. We know that Jesus can't be repeating or condemning repetition because we know that he himself repeats his own prayers. Do you ever read Matthew 26, verse 44? And remember that story when Jesus goes into the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Not my will, but your will. Remember that story? Matthew 26, 44 says Jesus repeated his prayer three times. I would never want to accuse Jesus of vain repetition. He's the model of prayer. How about the Old Testament? Daniel chapter 3, the three men in the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, over 30 times repeat over and over again, sing praise to him and may he be glorified forever. Sing praise to him and may his honor and glory forever. Over 30 times they keep repeating this prayer. And what does God do in heaven when he hears that? He goes, oh no, that's vain repetition. Stop. No, God comes and rescues them from the fiery furnace and protects them as they're being killed by the Babylonians. The book of Revelation chapter four, the four living creatures around God's throne never cease to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They repeat that prayer over and over again in heaven. If we don't like repetition here on earth, guess what? Heaven is gonna be all about repetition and praising God. Repetition is biblical and pleasing to the Lord. Using repetition to manipulate God like the pagans do is bad. That's what Jesus is going after. Does that make sense? So repetition is biblical and pleasing to God. But what about this idea of spending so much time with Mary? Again, fair question here. Let's, let's take a look at this. I would argue, you know, I, what I used to do when I would teach about the, the Hail Mary, I would say, well, this is a prayer. It's, you know, it's, it, it's about Mary, but it's asking Mary to pray for us. And that's what a lot of people in apologetics would say is, oh, yeah, you know, Kind of, you, know, I don't, it's, you know, it's about Mary, but we're asking Mary to pray for us to lead us to Jesus. And that's true. 
But I would go a step further now. I would go with John Paul II, what he does. You know what he says? He says, those Hail Marys we repeat over and over again, these prayers are Jesus prayers. If you love Jesus, you want to pray the Hail Mary. That, I'm paraphrasing JP2, but that's basically the point he makes. This is a Jesus prayer. It's centered on Christ. It's addressed to Mary, but it's all about Jesus. How do you see this? It, it, I, want to get, I, I want your full attention right now. Can you give me your fullest attention? The reason is what I'm going to share with you the next five minutes, it, this isn't my own insight. I'm sharing with you JP2's wisdom, but it changed the way I think about the Hail Mary and the Rosary. And if you don't remember anything else from tonight's presentation, but you give me your best in the next five minutes, I think it'll really make a difference for you too because it's beautiful stuff from JP2. So you ready with me? Let's talk about the Hail Mary. He divides the Hail Mary into two halves. And he says, in the first half of the Hail Mary, we enter into the praise of heaven and earth over the mystery of Christ. Let's think about what those first words are in the first half of the Hail Mary. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Who spoke those words? Gabriel. And then, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Who spoke those words? Elizabeth in the visitation. So let's think about those words. First of all, Gabriel comes to Mary, announces to her that she's going to be the mother of the Son of God. And his opening words are, Hail, full of Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Think about what those words would have meant for Gabriel. Put yourself in the archangel Gabriel's shoes here. Imagine this. You're Gabriel. Who came first, Gabriel or Mary? Gabriel existed long before Mary did. How about what came first, Gabriel or the city of Nazareth, the town of Nazareth? Gabriel came before Nazareth, right? Who came first, Gabriel or the nation of Israel? Gabriel. Who came first, Gabriel or planet Earth? <laughs> right, in fact, what did God make before he even made the physical universe, the cosmos? What did he make first? The angels. So Gabriel's existed from the very beginning, the very beginning, before God even created the universe. And picture for all your life, if you're Gabriel, you are praising God worshiping and adoring the almighty, infinite God. You are worshiping God. You are loving this God. And then one day, this God tells you to go down to this little, 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 tiny planet called Earth and go to this little, little, tiny, obscure village called Nazareth and, and go talk to this tiny, tiny little creature, this woman named Mary, and announce to her that the almighty, all-holy, all-powerful, all-good God that infinite God you've been worshiping and adoring from the beginning of your existence, this God is about to become a baby inside of her womb? Whoa! Uh, as an angel, he's, he's, he goes to Mary and he says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you like he's never been with anyone else before. This is just blowing his mind away. The mystery of the infinite God entering Finite little Mary, wow, in awe over the mystery of God becoming man in Mary's womb, Gabriel says those words, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Now let's talk about Elizabeth here. Elizabeth, she is, 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 is pregnant with her own child and Mary comes to visit her in the visitation scene in Luke chapter 1. And before Mary even says anything, Elizabeth knows that Mary is pregnant. And she knows that Mary is pregnant, not with any ordinary child, but with the Holy Son of God. Now, here's the big deal. How does Elizabeth even know this? Why does Elizabeth suddenly say, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb? How does Elizabeth know? Do you know how? Because on her way from Nazareth down to Elizabeth's house, Mary texted her. <laughs> I'm preg too. <laughs> She changed her status on social media. Pregnant now? No. How does Elizabeth know? Elizabeth knows because the Bible tells us that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That, that's, that's an expression used in the Bible to, to describe someone who has prophetic insight. So she's given prophetic wisdom. She knows that Mary's pregnant. She knows that Mary's pregnant not with any ordinary child, but with the Holy Son of God. And in awe over the mystery of God becoming man and Mary, what does Elizabeth say? Blessed are you among all women, for blessed is the fruit of your womb. I want you to feel the weight of what's really happening every time you say the Hail Mary. 
John Paul II reminds us that every time we pray the Hail Mary, we enter into the ecstatic praise of heaven and earth over the mystery of Jesus Christ, the God who became man. Every time we pray the Hail Mary, we enter into that ecstatic joy of heaven represented by whom? Gabriel. Earth represented by whom? Elizabeth. Heaven and earth, Gabriel and Elizabeth, we repeat their words of praise over the mystery of Jesus, the God who became man. Is that Christ-centered? I think so. That's all about Jesus. That's what we're doing when we repeat the Hail Mary. We're praising God for becoming man in Jesus Christ. Now, what about the second half of the Hail Mary? Second half, we say, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. We're asking Mary to intercede for us. Mary, who said yes at the Annunciation and all throughout her life and welcomed God into her womb. We ask her to help us in our life to say yes. Pray for us, Mary, that we may say yes like you did. And we may welcome the same Jesus into our souls more through grace. So even the second half of the Hail Mary is focused on Jesus. But what about the middle of the Hail Mary? John Paul II talks about the very middle of the Hail Mary. He calls this one word the hinge of the Hail Mary. He calls this one word the center of gravity for the Hail Mary. What word is that? The holy name of Jesus. That's the center of gravity. And John Paul II says, when we approach the name of Jesus in the Hail Mary, we should pray it with reverence, speak his name with love. And he's worried that sometimes we as Catholics just rush through the Hail Mary and we don't give the name of Jesus the reverence we should. You know, I once had the chance to attend the fastest rosary on earth. The fastest rosary on earth. There was a parish that I, I went to for a while, and they would have the rosary every day before Mass, and it was a nine-minute rosary. I kid you not. They sounded this fast. Uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. They sounded like auctioneers. I mean, it was just so fast. It was so intense. Uh, and God blessed them because they were praying the rosary, you know. But, but I think John Paul II would invite them and all of us to slow down a bit. I have a priest friend that says we should treat the, the name of Jesus in the Hail Mary like a speed bump. Slow down. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. You know, those bumps in the road, they get you to slow down. Slow down at the name of Jesus to, to give reverence to it. Another thing John Paul II often did, and some European countries pray it this way. You may have heard of this. Uh, they'll, they'll add a clause after Jesus' name for each one of the ten Hail Marys for that decade to help you relate those ten Hail Marys to the particular mystery you're contemplating. So for example, the first sorrowful mystery, you could pray, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, agonized in the garden. Jesus, agonized in the garden. Or Jesus, sweating like drops of blood. Or Jesus, strengthened by the angel. For the first glorious mystery, you could say, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, risen from the dead. Or Jesus, appearing to Mary Magdalene. Or Jesus, touched by Thomas. You could do something that helps you to kind of bring your mind back to the mystery. And if you're spiritually ADHD like I am sometimes, I mean, I, my mind's all wandering, and this just helps me, oh, resurrection. Oh, Jesus in the garden. It's a beautiful way to pray it. So in summary, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about these beads in the rosary. I want you to think about the, 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 the Hail Marys we repeat over and over again. I want you to think about them as, uh, think about them as, as ways of expressing our love for our God. That's what John Paul II said. He said, we have to understand the repetition of the Hail Mary in the dynamic of love. I love that. You know, my wife and I, just last week, I took my wife out for a nice dinner in Denver to celebrate our 19th anniversary, so 19 years of marriage. And in our 19 years of marriage, we, we have many terms of endearment, but there's three basic words every couple uses. I love you. And I've spoken those words to Beth thousands of times in her 19 years of marriage. Sometimes I'm running out the door and I'll yell, love you, honey. Have a good day. Other times I, I just whisper those words to her right before I fall asleep. I love you. And sometimes I get to go on date night with my wife. I can look her in the eye and say, I love you. I've spoken those three words to Beth 
thousands of times. Never once has Beth come back and said, can you come up with something more original? I'm just getting real tired of all this vain repetition. You just keep telling me you love me. I mean, my, can you come up with something more heartfelt? No, because repetition is a part of the language of love. And who here loves Jesus? We all love Jesus. If we have a personal relationship with Jesus, then repetition is going to be a part of our vocabulary. So like great lovers, we repeat over and over again at every Hail Mary that ecstatic joy of heaven and earth, of Gabriel and Elizabeth over the mystery of Christ. And prayer after prayer, we ask Mary to pray for us, to help us to say yes to Jesus like she did. And bead after bead, we affectionately repeat the name of our beloved. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 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 So that the holy name of Jesus, when spoken with tender love, really becomes the heartbeat for the rosary. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Now, I hope these tips are helpful to help us to pray it better, but I want to speak now to those who are a little intimidated by the rosary. Maybe they used to pray it, and they don't pray it that much anymore because they're just intimidated by it. They don't get a lot out of it. It just feels too long. Or those that are new to the rosary. I, I've never really prayed this prayer that much in my life. I want to give you some hope and encouragement and little practical things you could do for little baby steps with the rosary. Because I hear this all the time. Some people say, man, the rosary is just overwhelming. It's like the marathon of all Catholic devotions. It just keeps going on and on and on forever. Here's some encouraging things to do. If you're not praying the rosary right now, God wants you to bring it into your life. He does. May, Our Lady of Fatima for, so, said that we should pray this prayer every day. But I realize it may not be a part of your routine. And so one thing you could do is simply just say, I'm going to start and I'll just do one decade. Do you have two and a half minutes that you can give to God? That's all it takes to do one decade of the rosary, two and a half minutes. When you're driving home from work, when you walk out of here and go to the parking lot, you could get one decade done. Can you give God just two and a half days? Promise him that you'll do this for 40 days. For 40 days, you'll give him just one decade. If you just are starting, start there. Because I'll, I'll tell you, if you just give him just this, you'll notice something. You're not going to have some profound spiritual experience. I doubt you'll start seeing visions or uh, hear voices. I'm not talking about that. But you'll just notice how this helps to incorporate God into the rhythm of your daily life. The other thing I want to encourage you on is you, you don't have to pray the rosary all at once. I think many people think, I, gotta, I, gotta, I don't have 20 minutes where I can just sit down and pray this whole thing. You don't need 20 minutes to sit down. Do you have two and a half minute little pockets throughout your day when you're waiting in line at the grocery store, when you're driving home from work, when you're walking from one part of the building to the parking lot, maybe right before you go to bed, maybe right before you have a meal. You, you don't have to pray it all at once. You could do one part at a time. That's how Pope Benedict prayed this prayer. Did you know that? Pope Benedict wrote about how his mind wanders too much. It's too hard to do a whole set of mysteries all at once. And so he'll often break it up throughout the day. If it's good enough for Pope Benedict to pray it that way, guess what? You can pray it that way too. Don't feel like you have to do it all at once. It's better to do something than to do nothing. Is it great to sit down and get a whole rosary in? Sure, that's a wonderful thing. I try to do this with my family where we'll do a, a, ro a whole rosary and sometimes it's nice and peaceful. Little children are falling asleep. Everyone's doing nice meditation. Most of the time in the Sri family, it's like the Sri family circus rosary. You know, we're praying rosary. I've got a teenager needing, I, I really got to get my lunch together. And I got a little baby doing cartwheels and we're trying to pray it reverently. And I, I can't quite get it to the pious level I'd like. But I realize, you know what? Mary's rejoicing that the Sri's are at least trying to honor her and pray this prayer. So bring it into your life, even if it's just one decade a day. Amen? Okay, now let's talk about the mysteries of the rosary. That's what we're going to do as we walk through Mary's life. So what I was sharing with you is more from the rosary book. Now I want to walk through here the walk with Mary. And this is where I'm going to start using some of the themes uh, from the PowerPoint here. And I want to ask, if you had to think about the first step of faith that Mary took, the very first step of faith, where do we see Mary stepping out in faith in the Bible first? Does anyone know which scene? Where do we see? Where do we see Mary stepping out in faith? At the Annunciation. Okay, good. And, and what happened at the Annunciation where you see Mary step out in faith for the first time? What does she do? She says yes. She gives her famous fiat, right? 
She says, let it be done unto me according to your word. Behold, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. Remember that? How many of you agree with that, that that's the first time Mary steps out in faith? How many agree? Put your hands up. Okay, you're all wrong. <laughs> you're all wrong. But before 2008, I would have raised my hand as well. And I would have said, that's when we see Mary's first time in the Bible stepping out in faith. But then in 2008, I came across something Pope Benedict earlier in his life, as Ratzinger wrote about Mary, and showed me that there was something earlier in the Bible where we see Mary's great faith, earlier in Scripture. It's in the same scene of the Annunciation, but it's not her fiat. There's something even earlier that shows amazing faith in Mary. I want to open that up with you, okay? It's in Luke chapter 1, verse 29. This is going to be the first step of Mary's faith, where we're going to see her open heart. Luke 1, 29. Here's the story. You ready? The angel comes, appears to Mary, says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Luke 1, 28. And then in the next verse, Luke 1, 29, what does, what does the Bible tell us? It tells us that Mary was greatly troubled at the saying, and she considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. Luke 1, 29 is beautifully showing something about Our Lady. Let's think about this for a moment. First of all, what was Mary's emotional response when the angel says those words? What emotions did she have inside? Was it excitement? Cool, an angel's here, I'm so excited. Was that what happened? What does the Bible say? She was greatly troubled. She was afraid. She experienced fear. Do you ever experience fear in your life? Mary did. Mary was greatly troubled. Now, why was Mary greatly troubled? I always used to think she was greatly troubled, troubled because she saw an angel. All right, let's think about it. If you're in your kitchen and you're doing the dishes and you turn around and all of a sudden there's an archangel there, you would be greatly troubled too, wouldn't you? But that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible does not say Mary's troubled at the sight of the angel. What does Luke 1.29 say? She was greatly troubled at the saying, at the words of the angel. And she's pondering, considering in her mind what sort of greeting this is. When Zechariah is in the temple and sees an angel, John the Baptist's dad, he, he freaks out. He's troubled at the sight of the angel, Luke 1.15 tells us. But Luke 1.29 tells us Mary's troubled more by what the angel says than by simply being an angel in front of her. But here's my question for you. What's so troubling about what the angel said? The angel says, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. What's, what's so troubling about that? I mean, if I say to all of you, the Lord be with you, what do you all say? Because you know the new mass translation. <laughs> Did Mary know the new mass translation? Did she know the old mass translation? No, the mass hadn't been even put into existence yet. But what would those words have meant to Mary if you were just a young Jewish woman Growing up in the first century, and you heard the words, the Lord is with you, what would that bring to mind? Those were words that were spoken all throughout salvation history to certain men and women that were being called by God to go on some very important mission, to go on a, sent on a very important task sent by God. And they were going to be stretched like never before. They were going to have to rely on God like never before. That's why God or the angel will say, the Lord is with you. God will be with you to help you do what you cannot do on your own. Moses heard those words at the burning bush. You mean I have to go to Pharaoh and confront the wicked king where they tried to kill me? I, I'm scared. God says, I'll be with you, Moses. Gideon heard those words. He's getting ready to go and lead the people into the promised land where there's all these large armies ready to pounce on the Israelites and and, and jo it's Joshua, that is. Joshua's nervous about this, and God says, be courageous, Joshua. I will be with you. Gideon heard those words when he was called to fight off the enemy. David heard those words when he was starting his kingdom. The prophets heard these words when they were sent off in their prophetic ministry. Over and over again, that's how the Lord is with you was used. So if you're the Blessed Virgin Mary, and one day an angel appears to you and says, the Lord is with you, what are you thinking? You're thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> what is God asking of me? God's calling me to some daunting mission. She doesn't know what that mission is yet, but she's, she feels it. She's greatly troubled. She's nervous. What is this going to mean for me? Where is this going to go? And Mary's greatly troubled. But here's the key. Here's what Pope Benedict drew out, drew out of this. 
he focused on that word considered. It says, Mary considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. Now, the Greek word for considered is the word dialegetso, which is derived from the Greek word uh, where we get the word dialogue in English. And the idea is that Mary remains in dialogue with God. She's troubled. She's nervous. And while many people would be tempted to cut off the conversation, oh, I, I don't want to talk about that because I, I don't want to do anything too difficult. She doesn't do that. She's nervous. She's troubled. She's scared. But she keeps an open heart and talks to God. Listen to what Pope Benedict says about this line. Mary enters into an interior dialogue with the word. She carries on an inner dialogue with the word that has been given her. She speaks to it and lets it speak to her. In other words, Mary is greatly troubled. She experiences a lot of emotions and fears here about what is lying ahead. She knows God's calling her to some very difficult tasks. She doesn't know what it is. She doesn't know what it means for her. So she's nervous. That's natural. That's human. But Mary does not allow herself to be controlled by her emotions. She rises above those emotions of fear and trembling. And she remains in dialogue with God. She's going to keep talking to God about it, saying, God, what does this mean? What are you asking of me? Where is this leading? She remains in dialogue with God. Here's the difference between Mary and us. Are there times in your life where you sense God is asking you to change? God is asking you to do something. God's asking you to follow him in a deeper way. And you're a little nervous about that. And I don't mean like really big things where you have a big enunciation with a capital A like an angel appears to you. I mean the little A enunciations that happen all the time. You know, those little things like you kind of sense, I haven't called my mom in a while. I need to call my mom. Or you sense, there's this one child. I need to spend more time with this, this child of mine. Or you sense you have this little tension with your wife or your spouse and you, and you think, ah, I need to call and say I'm sorry. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you're not seeing visions or anything, but you just kind of have this sense from God, I'm supposed to do something. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Does that happen to you all in Australia? Okay. You know? okay. or, or it could be bigger things, like maybe there's something you're doing in your life that you know deep down you shouldn't be doing. You're consistently leaving work early, and you're thinking, you know, out of justice, I owe the company a full day's wage, a full day's work for the wages they're paying. I should probably not leave early all the time. Or I, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time on social media and YouTube videos while I'm at work. You know, I'm just kind of sensing maybe I should be doing that. Or, or maybe there's a certain show you're watching on TV or on Netflix or on HBO. There are certain you know, shows you're watching and deep down you know, I probably shouldn't be watching that show. I wouldn't watch the show if Father was here. Or, uh, but I, I, I can kind of know I probably shouldn't be listening to this music maybe because it's not it's, the, the lyrics are really bad and, and you know what I'm talking about and you kind of sense I should be doing and, and, and you feel a little fear well, I don't know if I want to give up this show I don't want to know if I want to give up leaving work early I don't know if I want to give up this music and you, you kind of feel nervous about it when those things happen in life where we sense God pressing in calling us think of it as God we're on we're at our chair like little Josephine and God saying take the next step I want, to, I want you to come closer to me. I want to be in a deeper relationship with you. I love you so much. Give that thing up. Make that change. Step out in faith. Trust me. And, and you know what we tend to do? When we sense God is asking us to do something different and we have those emotions and those fears and those attachments, many of us, we do not remain in dialogue with God. We cut off the conversation. We say, oh, no, God doesn't mind. It's not a big deal. Everybody watches this show. Everybody listens to this music. I'm not, I, you know, the, I'm, I don't listen to the lyrics. I just like the beat. We do these little games of rationalization where we're not really open to God. We cut off the conversation. Mary wasn't like that. Mary did not allow herself to be controlled by her emotions. She rose above the emotions because she wanted to be a woman that followed God generously. Do you do that with your life? Next time you feel that in your life where you're sensing God wants you to do something and you're nervous about it, talk to him about it. What do you have to lose by talking? You just say, God, are you wanting me to really give up that show? God, are you really wanting me to say sorry? God, are you really wanting me to apologize to this friend? Or God, are you really wanting me to give up this music? Just talk to him about it. Ask him. Don't cut off the conversation. That's the first step of faith we see with Mary. Mary had an open heart. Now we come to what you all turn to, and that's the fiat. Luke 138, great verse here. 
Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. Mary describes herself as the handmaiden of the Lord. I want you to know that the word here, sometimes translated servant of the Lord, literally in the Greek, it's the word that is translated slave. Mary describes herself as a slave of the Lord. Now that sounds negative in our world today. It sounds restrictive. But what we see is that Mary's a woman that's full of a desire to live for God and not for herself. Our modern world says, oh, don't be a servant, don't be a slave, don't be a handmaiden, just, just be independent, do your own thing, be your own person, live for yourself. You should be free, you should be free to do whatever you want with your own life. But when we live that way, if I'm just free to do what I want, when I want, how I want, as often as I want, I'm not free. I become a slave to my selfish interests. Mary wasn't like that. Mary wanted to live for something bigger than herself. She saw that her life was not her own, that it was a gift from God, and she wants to give her life back as a gift to God. That's why she describes herself as a servant or a slave, but think of it like a lover. Do you ever see two people when they fall in love? When they fall in love, they just want to be together all the time. They love each other, they just want to be together. And you could look at them on the outside thinking, oh wow, they're just slaves, they just have to be together all the time. No, no, it's love that's motivating and that's what's propelling Mary to want to be a servant of the Lord. She wants to live her life totally for God because it's as if she sees God's heart and like a lover, she wants to run after her beloved's desires. She wants to do what God wants. That's why she calls herself the servant of the Lord. Now let's go to the next part of the story. I want to jump ahead. Nine months down the road, we're at Christmas here. And do you ever get a Christmas card in the mail where you have a nice piece of art about the Christmas story? Do you ever see Mary in that kind of art or maybe Mary at the nativity scenes you have at your churches? What does Mary look like? First of all, what, what is she wearing? What color clothes? Blue, nice white, maybe some red in it, just perfectly draped like it just got back from the cleaners. It was perfect. And her, what are her hands look like? What are her hands doing? Nice and pious like this, or maybe spread out like this. And, you know, and I, I love this religious art, you know, because it just shows Mary, Mary's purity, her ardent devotion to her son. It's beautiful. But that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story of what was going on in Mary's life at Christmas. In fact, most of what was happening with Mary's life around the Christmas story is pretty traumatic. Think about what's going on in Mary's life here. Here she is. She's living up in Nazareth. Roman soldiers come in one day. She's in her last trimester of her pregnancy, and they announce that Joseph has to go all the way down to Bethlehem to be counted in his hometown. And she's thinking, oh, my, I'm in my last trimester. I've got to move? Can I ask ladies here that have been pregnant, can I ask you, is that on your bucket list, the desire to move in your last trimester? Is that one of those things you just hope you could do someday? <laughs> I did that to my poor wife. We, I, we moved when she was expecting our fourth child in the last trimester in the summer. Hot, humid Kansas. Oh, it was horrible. We moved to Colorado and, and she's up in the attic. She's moving and just feeling exhausted. And I kept trying to cheer her up and I said, hey, honey, I'm just trying to be like Joseph. Don't, guys, don't use that line. Um, but, but, but Mary, when she shows up at Bethlehem, she finally gets to Bethlehem, what happens? She's just made this big sacrifice to travel there. She's the mother of the Messiah. She's the great queen mother. And, and what happens in Bethlehem? Does the Bethlehem Chamber of Commerce come out and says, oh, you're the mother of the Messiah. Welcome to our town. We're so excited. We got this wonderful place for you to have the Messiah. Is that what happens? No, there's no welcoming at all. She has to give birth to Jesus in these austere, rugged conditions. There's not even a place to lay down the baby. She has to put the baby in a manger, a feeding trough for the animals. If you're Mary, you're wondering, what's going on here? What happened? Nine months ago, an angel came to me and told me this was going to be the Holy Son of God, the great Messiah King, and he's entering the world this way? Born in such poverty, humility, rejection, suffering? Why is this happening, God? You can imagine Mary being a little perplexed. God, where are you in all this? What, is this all really true? What's happening? Are there times in your life where you feel your world was turned upside down? Where you feel you're wondering, Lord, where are you? Why is this happening? What's going on here? Do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe there's something that's happening with your job. You have a new boss, 
your company's downsizing, you lose your job. Lord, what, what just happened here? Maybe it's a financial issue. Maybe it's a dating relationship you're in. You're really hoping that this was the one and then now you realize it's not we're turning out the way you hoped and your world is just turned upside down. Lord, where are you in the midst of all this? You ever felt that way? Mary felt that way. Do you have moments where maybe like you, you have a difficult thing going on in your family or maybe there's a health issue with someone you love? Maybe you lost someone in the last year and you're wondering, God, this really hurts. Why did this have to happen? If you've ever experienced this bewilderment, wondering, God, why is this happening this way? Mary was right there. She was there at Bethlehem wondering, this was supposed to be the great son of God and he's entering the world this way? What's Mary's response to all this? What does Mary do? You know, sometimes when we have problems, we have difficulties, we face crosses in life, you know what we do? We have different temperaments. We have some people that are very melancholic and they're just always sad and everything's always wrong. Oh, life is hard and all these bad things happen. Do you ever meet people like that? They're kind of like Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh. Well, it's all so hard. You know, there's some people that just are gloomy like that. That's not what God wants for us. Then there's other people who get really bitter and hardened in life. And they tend to be angry and lose their temper and are, 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 are toxic with other people. That's not the way to go. Then there's others who are more like the type A personality. They just want to fix it. They're going to do all these things. I'm just going to fix it. I just want to fix everything. I want everything to be just like it was before. Like my little daughter Josephine clinging to the chair. Instead of seeing that these crosses that are right here, God's inviting us to take these next steps and to grow and to follow him. Mary doesn't do any of those things. When Mary is there at Bethlehem, do you hear her complaining, saying, I can't believe this is happening. This is so hard. Or do you see Mary saying, oh, don't they know who I am? People are, are all generations are going to call me blessed someday. Don't they realize that? <laughs> I'm the Immaculata. And it doesn't, she doesn't do that. What is Mary's one response? We hear about it in Luke chapter 2, verse 19. Mary keeps all these things and ponders them in her heart. Now, what does, that, what does that expression mean in the Bible? To keep and ponder is used in the Old Testament to describe someone that experiences something mysterious, and a mysterious teaching or a mysterious event or a mysterious vision. They don't know what it means. So they're mulling it over. They're spiritually pondering it in order to live out the meaning of what God is showing them. Think of it this way. It's as if when Mary keeps and ponders, it's as if she's saying to God, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? Lord, what are you trying to show me through this? You see, we might not be able to control what's happening on the outside of our lives. I may not be able to control what's happening in the workplace, with my job, with my career, with my money, with my family, with my spouse, with my kids, with this health issue. I might not be able to control those things. But I should have faith that whatever is happening out here, God could use it to bring some good in here. That he's allowing me to experience this so I can grow maybe in patience. You know, maybe I just like having my things my way all the time and now things aren't working out, so I'm going to grow in patience here. It's a chance to grow in patience. Maybe he's allowing me to experience this suffering because I'm used to being very successful and everything is right. I got good grades. I got good compliments. I'm doing all those good things. And now I feel like a failure and God's allowing me to grow in humility. That's good for my soul. It's good for me to grow in humility. I don't like it. It hurts, but it's good for me to depend more on God and not on myself. Maybe he wants me to grow in trust. Maybe he's allowing me to experience some suffering so that I can have more compassion on other people that are going through suffering. I don't know what the issue is, but whatever's happening on the outside of our lives, we have to see God may be using that to bring some good here. Do you keep and ponder in your life like Mary? Do you turn to God and say, God, what are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to show me? Instead of complaining or being bitter or just trying to fix your problem, keep and ponder like Mary does, because that's where spiritual growth really happens. And what I think Mary kept and pondered is what Luke's gospel subtly shows us. You know, Luke chapter 2, verse 7 tells us some interesting little details about Jesus' birth. It's the only verse that you learn anything about Jesus' birth. Everything else in the, in the nativity story is all about Herod and shepherds and angels. There's only one verse about the actual birth of Jesus. Did you know that? And here's what Luke tells us. Luke says that Mary gave birth to her son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. That's it. Nothing more. 
I mean, I, there's a lot of things I want to know about. Why do I need to know he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger? Of all the things Luke could tell us, why does he tell us, what does the baby look like? What color eyes did he have? How did Mary feel? Was he laughing? Was he smiling? How was Joseph? Did Joseph get to cut the cord? I mean, what happened here? Is there anything? Uh, that, uh, what was going on with the family? I'd love to know those things. All I learned is the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. Why does Luke give us that little detail? Biblical authors will often use key words and then use them again later on in the story to make a point. And there's only two times in all of Luke's gospel where you will see those two verbs back to back, wrapped and laid. The baby was wrapped in swallowing clothes and laid in a manger. When is the next time those words are used? In Luke chapter 23, verse 55, at the cross. When they take Jesus' body down from the cross, what do they do with it? They wrap it in linen garments and laid the body in the tomb, wrapped and laid. What's the point Luke's making? Is that the way Jesus enters this world, he's entering this world in poverty, humility, rejection, suffering. The way he enters this world is a foreshadowing of how he's going to leave this world. In other words, what happens in Bethlehem foreshadows Calvary. What happens on uh, Chris, the first Christmas foreshadows the first Good Friday. God is trying to teach Mary and all of us something very important. Jesus is indeed the great Messiah, the great Holy Son of God that Mary heard about at the Annunciation. But the kind of Messiah and Son of God that he is isn't meant to be understood in worldly glory and power and might. It's meant to be understood as the glory of the Son of God in His suffering and sacrificial love on the cross. And Mary gets a taste of that right here at the Nativity. I used to think the first time that Mary got a taste of the cross was at Simeon's words. And that's what happens next. Remember the story of Simeon here? Mary goes on the presentation, presents the baby in the temple, and then this strange prophet figure comes up and says, this child's destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel. He will be a sign that's spoken against, contradicted, plotted against, and, he, and a sword's going to pierce him, and it's going to go through your soul also, Mary. I mean, just imagine Mary hearing that. Imagine, you know, if there was a, a hospital nearby here in Rudy Hill, and, and there, there was the maternity ward, and there was a mom holding her brand new baby, and all excited holding the baby, and then imagine if some strange prophet figure comes in and says, this child's going to be hated by all Australians. And when he gets older, they're going to plot against him. And eventually, he's going to be assassinated. I mean, imagine a mom hearing that story and be like, i got to go hide this baby. <laughs> but Mary hears those words, and she continues to say yes. I used to think this was the first moment where Mary experienced where this was going, the cross. But it was actually at Bethlehem in watching her son be rejected in Bethlehem. Now it's made even clearer in Simeon's prophecy about the sword. But imagine being a mom having to carry the burden of that prophecy, knowing that one day your son will grow up, he'll begin his ministry, he'll be hated, misunderstood, opposed, and killed. That would be a hard burden to carry. And that leads us to the last scene I want to, continue, I want to look at, Mary's choice at Cana. We often don't think of this as a profound moment for Mary. It's a great story, and she's there, and she's important, but to think about Mary's choice, do you know the choice she had to make that day? This was an intense choice. I'll be honest, I don't know if I was in her shoes if I would have made the same choice. I wish I would have, but I know my own human weakness. I don't know if I would have made the choice she made at Cana. I'd want to, but I don't know if I have it in me. Let's talk about what happened with Mary at Cana. So she goes to this wedding feast, and then you know the story, they run out of wine, which isn't just like bad, you know, a little problem. It's, it's a major social catastrophe. To run out of wine at a wedding feast would be shame upon this family for generations. You, 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 if you do a public wedding feast in this kind of a culture, it's a culture of honor and shame, you would be shamed for generations if you ran out of wine. You always had to have enough wine. And Mary is the first person to notice this impending doom upon the family. And she goes to the one person who can make a difference. She goes to Jesus and she says, they have no wine. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes back and he says those strange words. You ever wonder about these words? Jesus says, woman, 
What have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Do you ever wonder about those words? I mean, if you take those words out of first century Jewish biblical context and you put them in our modern world today, doesn't that sound a little rough? Doesn't it sound like Jesus is kind of pushing his mom away? I mean, imagine if there's some teenager here in Sydney uh, whose mom calls him and says, Hey, Johnny, time to come down for dinner. Could you set the table, Johnny? And imagine Johnny coming down and saying, Hey, woman, um, what's this to you and to me? I mean, my hour has not yet come. I still have 30 minutes on my Xbox. <laughs> if I talk that way to my Italian mom, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> But we have to put these words in their original context. And one thing we see is it's clear. If you just read the story, when Jesus says those words to Mary, read the context. How does Mary interpret those words? Does Mary interpret those words something, as something negative or something positive? She interprets them as something positive, right? Does she, does she hear those words and says, now don't you talk that way to me, Jesus? Or does she hear those words and go, oh, Jesus, don't embarrass me in public like that. No, that's not what she does. What does she say? Do whatever he tells you. In other words, what is she assuming? That Jesus is going to perform the miracle. Jesus is going to fulfill her request. She doesn't interpret these words negatively. How does Jesus interpret his own words? When Mary says that, does, does Jesus say, Now wait, Mary, I never said I was going to do anything. What are you doing? No, no. What does Jesus do? He performs the miracle. He fulfills her request. So if you just read the Bible, it's very clear Whatever these mysterious words mean, they're nothing negative. But let's unpack what they do mean. And let's talk about this. First of all, Jesus calls his mother woman. That in itself has great profound significance in the Jewish tradition. Because who is the first person in the Bible called woman? Eve. Eve. Eve is the woman. And there was a great prophecy given in Genesis about the woman. There's a great prophecy given, and that prophecy is found in Genesis 3.15, and it's all after the fall, after Adam and Eve sinned, God says that the woman will have a son, a descendant, an heir, who will come and defeat the serpent, defeat the devil. He will crush the head of the serpent. So this is the foundational prophecy that the woman will have a descendant that will defeat the devil. And so when Jesus calls his mother woman, when he says woman, he's not, that, 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 you can't take that in our culture today. He's referring to the woman of Genesis. He's referring to Eve. She, Mary is the new Eve. Mary is the woman whose son, Jesus, is going to defeat the devil. Catch that? Then, then Jesus says, my hour's not yet come. What's that a reference to? In the Gospel of John, there's the theme of the hour all throughout John's Gospel. There's this theme about an hour that's coming. It's coming soon. It's not here yet. And it's almost here. And they try to kill Jesus, but he escapes because his hour has not yet come. And as a reader, you're feeling this tension and this mounting suspense about some mysterious hour. When is it coming? And finally you get to John 12. Jesus enters Jerusalem riding on the donkey. And now he comes and says in Holy Week, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And he talks about his death. He talks about him giving up his life. And in this hour, in John chapter 12, verse 31, Jesus describes this hour as the moment when he's lifted up from the earth, lifted up on the cross. And he'll draw all men to himself, and the ruler of this world will be cast down, he says in John 12, 31. So in this hour, Jesus will be lifted up on the cross, and the ruler of the world will be cast down. Who's the ruler of the world? It's not Google. Not Facebook. Who's the ruler of this world? The devil, the, the ancient serpent. So in other words, in Jesus' hour, the devil will be defeated. Genesis 3.15 will be fulfilled. Do you see how the two words go together? Woman, and my hour is not yet come, but it's coming soon. So that, that's, that, I think that's important. But the most important thing I want you to get out of these words is, is the middle expression, a Hebrew idiom in Greek, tiamoi kaisoi, but it, it, it means, to, what is this to you and to me? It describes two people looking at the same thing, but from a different perspective. Two people looking at the same thing, but they're looking at it from different angles. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's basically saying, what is this? Mary come and says, comes and says, they have no wine. And Jesus says, what is this? What is this wine 
to you and to me. To you, it means one thing, but to me, it means something else. In other words, Mary sees the, the social disaster about to happen. She feels bad for the couple and the family. And so she presents the problem to Jesus and wants Jesus to provide wine to help at the wedding feast. A noble, a noble request. But Jesus, like many times in John's gospel, he'll take the person's natural material request, like for wine, and he's going to elevate. He says, to you, you want me just to provide wine for the wedding feast, but for me, this wine will mean something much more significant. You see, Mary, if I perform this miracle, if I provide this wine, this will be the first public miracle I perform. This will be the first time my glory is made manifest and people are going to start believing in me. So if I perform this miracle, it's going to be the beginning of my public ministry, Mary. And, and, and mom, if I perform this miracle, then you're no longer just mom. You are woman. You are, my public ministry begins. You are now a woman, the woman of Genesis 3.15, whose son is going to begin his mission to defeat the devil. And if I perform this miracle, reveal my glory, people start believing me, and I start my mission of trying to defeat the devil, then my hour, which has not yet come, is starting to come soon, Mary. Are you sure that's what you want? In other words, Jesus is basically saying, if I perform this miracle and I begin my public ministry, my hour is not yet here, but the hour is going to start coming. The clock will start ticking on my life. The sword that Simeon talked about 30 years ago when I was a 40-day-old baby in the temple, that sword is getting closer to piercing my side and piercing your heart. Are you sure that's what you want, Mom? Do you want me to perform this miracle? Now, I'll be honest with you, if that were me, and I was hearing all that, I'd probably be like, that's okay, we, we don't need wine, we'll just serve lemonade. Lemonade will be fine, we'll just serve some iced tea, you know, so yeah, that'll, that'll just be, we don't need, we don't need more wine, because I'd want to hold on to my son more for myself. But is that what Mary does here? That's not what Mary does. Mary continues to say yes. She continues to say yes. And without skipping a beat, what is her choice at Cana? John chapter 2, verse 5, she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And those words are the last words spoken by Mary in all of Scripture. She appears in many scenes after this, but she never speaks a word in the Bible. And those words of Mary are like a, a, her last will and testament to us to encourage all of us to do whatever he tells us. That's what Mary does all throughout her life from the Annunciation to the Visitation to the Nativity to the Presentation to Cana to the Cross. She's always doing what God wants. And Mary's yes wasn't just one time at her fiat at the Annunciation. John Paul II said Mary had to continually renew her fiat. And it reminds us that we have to continually say yes over and over again. So let's turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. May she be the inspiration for us, the model for us. She's the first disciple in the Bible. She's the model disciple. And she's the one that sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding for or the right hand of the Son, that is. Jesus at the right hand of the Father and Mary is at the right hand of her son as the queen mother interceding for us. All right, my friends, this has been a lot of fun here, and I'd love to take time to walk through more about the Blessed Virgin Mary, but I want to share with you up on the screen here, these are the two things that we have here. So we have, if you want to learn more about those various steps, there's actually, I identify nine key pivotal moments in Scripture in this book, Walking with Mary. Uh, we only had time to go through about four or five of them, but there's really, there's, I think you could say there's at least nine, if not more. Uh, so if you want to get to know that human Mary, what she was going through step by step, that's what this book is about. And I promised you that I would tell you a little bit about this uh, video series that we did. So we did a documentary a few years ago in the Holy Land to help us to get to know Mary in the Bible. There's a lot of apologetics in this, a lot of theology about Mary, a lot of spirituality about Mary. But what's beautiful about this, this is like a, a, a virtual pilgrimage because you get to go and see the places where all these events in Mary's life took place. I remember just being so moved how we got to go teach about the wedding at Cana, right at Cana, where the miracle took place. 
I remember being able to go to the visitation and think, this is where Mary, she came into the hill country of Judea, and, and this is where she came and visited Elizabeth. We got to film at Calvary. That was amazing. We had a pass, a permit to, to, to film for like two or three minutes at Calvary. But there was a Greek Orthodox monk who was working the station that day, and he heard we were doing a documentary on Mary. And he says, I love Mary. Stay as long as you want. We got to, if you've ever been to Calvary, there's a long line of 90 minutes of people waiting. And this monk let us film for like an hour right there where Jesus died and where Mary stood at the foot of the cross as her son was dying. That was amazing. My favorite part was when we got to go to Nazareth. We got to go to film in the church of the, of the Annunciation built over Mary's house where the Annunciation took place. But if you've ever been there, you can't go into Mary's house. There's like this, it's like from here to that table, there's a gate. And inside there are the excavations. And, and, and we were going to just film way out here and kind of see it through the gate. And I said, I, I want to go in. We got to go in and film this there. And the guards just kept saying, no, you can't. No, you can't. No, you have to talk to the abbot. And I said, who's the abbot? And he told me the name. And I, I heard it was an Italian name. So I realized, oh, the, he must be Italian. Yeah, oh, yes, he's Italian. I go, oh, good. Because I speak, a I'm half Italian. And I speak a little Italian. But most of all, I know how Italians are with rules. They're kind of like, eh, cozy, cozy, maybe. So I thought, oh, can I talk to the abbot? So sure enough, the abbot comes out and talks to me. We're talking about Italian. I told him where my mom was born. He was all excited. And then I asked him if we could film. And he said, well, no, you can't go in there because the, the, the structure is not safe. But maybe if I go with you, maybe we, we go for five minutes. He let us stay for 20. And I was like a little kid. I'm like touching the walls. This is where the angel came. Oh my goodness. But it's great. So you go, as you go through this, you go through Mary's life and you're studying the scriptures, but you're seeing, you're seeing the places where all these events in Mary's life unfolded. So I know many people, many families buy this just as a documentary to, to learn about the Holy Land and learn about Mary. And they just watch the videos. But what I think is really profound, and Charbel will talk more about it, is there's actually a, a study kit that we have. If people want to get together in small groups at your parish, at your school, and your family, people can get together in small groups and, and watch the videos together and study the scriptures together to learn more about Mary. So this could be a great, a great resource for small groups. The last thing I have that's not on there is the book about the rosary. If you're looking for those tips on how to pray the rosary better, how to not be so distracted, suggestions on how to just get started and on-ramp in the rosary, that you can find in this book here in the Rosie. They have all of these materials at the table. So we can stay in touch, my friends. I've got, if you like this talk, uh, I have a lot of my talks just available on video for free on my website, edwardsfree.com. You can go to my video page. Um, you can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on Instagram now, so you can find me there. And lastly, uh, Charbel mentioned my podcast, All Things Catholic. So any of you listen to podcasts? Any podcast listeners out there? All right, so I have a weekly podcast comes out every Tuesday. Uh, you can look me up on iTunes, Edward Sri, or you can find it on my webpage. Don't just put Sri. If you put S R I, you'll get a Hindi, uh, uh, an Indian Hindu guru. That's not me. So Edward Sri will get you to all things Catholic. I'm on there as well.